In the Old Testament, Jesus said, All who hate me love death. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Accepting Him as your Lord and Savior and choosing to follow Him puts you on the way. Obeying the truth of God's Word keeps you on the way, the way that ends in eternal life. Your eternal destiny will be determined by your choices in this world. Steps to Life exists to help people find the way, the truth, and the life. to study with you for a few minutes this evening about the tipping point. Let's see if I can, yeah, the tipping point. A tipping point is, you can also call it a turning point. You reach that point and you go beyond that point and you can't turn back. You've gone so far that you have to go on. Uh, in, uh, in flying, commercial aircraft, they had they, the, the pilots, they, they, I don't know if they still do it, I think they still do it, they call voice signals to each other. And when they say V2, you have to take off at that point. You have gone so far, and you're going down the runway, and you're going so fast that you have to take off. So a, a turning point, a tipping point, is a, it's a place where You've gone so far that, that you can't turn back. Now here's the tipping point. That is a artist's conception of the sinking of the Titanic, which occurred on April 14, 1912. It was on its maiden voyage and it had 2,224 passengers and crew. Some of the wealthiest people in the world were on board. Most of them drowned. Of the 2,224 people on the ship, only 705 were saved. The rest all drowned. They only had enough lifeboats for 1,178 people, but they didn't even get all the lifeboats filled. They hit a, scraped an iceberg about 11.40 p.m. on April 14. There's another view of it. And here is the, an account that was given by Elizabeth Schutz. She was on board. She was one of the few saved. <clears throat> she, at this time, she was 40 years of age. She was a governess to a 19-year-old Margaret Graham who was traveling with her parents. And uh, this is what she says happened. There's another view of it. She says she was in a first-class cabin. She said she felt a shudder travel through the ship, and at first she was comforted by her belief in the safety of the ship, but her composure was soon shattered by the realization of imminent tragedy. She said, suddenly a queer quivering ran under me, apparently the whole length of the ship. Startled by the very strangest of the shivering motion, I sprang to the floor. With too perfect a trust in that mighty vessel, I again lay down. Someone knocked at my door, and the voice of a friend said, come quickly to my cabin. An iceberg has just passed our window. I know we have just struck one. There was no confusion or noise of any kind. One could believe no danger imminent. Our stewardess came and said she could learn nothing. Looking out into the companionway, I saw heads appearing asking questions from half-closed doors. All still no excitement. I sat down again. My friend was by this time dressed. Still her daughter and I talked on, Margaret pretending to eat a sandwich. Margaret was the one that she was supposed to be the governess for. Her hand shook so that the bread kept parting company from the chicken. Then I saw she was frightened. And for the first time I was too. But why get dressed, as no one had given the slightest hint of any possible danger? An officer's cap passed the door. I asked, is there any accident or danger of any kind? 
None so far as I know, was his courteous answer, spoken quietly and most kindly. This same officer then entered a cabin a little distance down the companionway, and by this time, distrustful of everything, I listened intently, and I distinctly heard the following words. Quote, we can keep the water out for a while. Then, and not until then, did I realize the horror of an accident at sea. Now it was too late to dress. No time for a waste, but a coat and a skirt were soon on. Slippers were quicker than shoes. The stewardess put on our life preservers, and we were just ready when Mr. Roebling came to tell us he would take us to our friend's mother, who was waiting above. No laughing throng. But on either side of the staircases stand quietly, bravely the stewards, all equipped with white, ghostly life preservers. Always the thing one tries not to see, even crossing a ferry. Now, only pale faces. Each form strapped about with those white bars. So gruesome a scene. We passed on. The awful goodbyes. The quiet look of hope in the brave men's eyes as the wives were put into lifeboats. They put the women and children on first. Nothing escaped one at this fearful moment. We left from the sun deck, 75 feet above the water. Mr. Case and Mr. Roebling, brave American men, saw us to the lifeboat, made no effort to save themselves, but stepped back on the deck. Later they went to an honored grave. Our lifeboat, with 36 in it, began lowering to the sea. This was done amid the greatest confusion. Rough seamen were all giving different orders, no officer aboard. As only one side of the ropes worked, the lifeboat at one time was in such a position that it seemed we must capsize in midair. At last the ropes worked together, and we drew near and near the black, oily water. The first touch of our lifeboat on that black sea came to me as a last goodbye to life. And so we put off. A tiny boat on a great sea rowed away from what had been a safe home for five days. The first wish on the part of all was to stay near the Titanic. We all felt so much safer near the ship. Surely such a vessel could not sink. I thought the danger must be exaggerated, and we could all be taken aboard again. But surely the outline of that great good ship was growing less. The bow of the boat was getting black. Light after light was disappearing. And now those rough seamen put to their oars and we were told to hunt under seats, any place, anywhere, for a lantern, a light of any kind. Every place was empty. There was no water, no stimulant of any kind, not a biscuit, nothing to keep us alive had we drifted long. Sitting by me in the lifeboat were a mother and daughter. The mother had left a husband on the Titanic and the daughter a father and husband. And while we were near the other boats, those two stricken women would call out a name and ask, Are you there? No, would come back. The awful answer. But these brave women never lost courage, forgot their own sorrow, telling me to sit close to them to keep warm. The life preservers helped to keep us warm, but the night was bitter cold, and it grew colder and colder, and just before dawn, the coldest, darkest hour of all, no help seemed possible. The stars slowly disappeared, and in their place came the faint pink glow of another day. Then I heard a light, a ship. I could not, I would not, Look while there was a bit of doubt, but kept my eyes away. All night long I had heard a light. Each time it proved to be one of our other lifeboats. Someone lighting a piece of paper, anything they could find to burn, and now I could not believe. Someone found a newspaper. It was lighted and held up. Then I looked and saw a ship. A ship bright with lights, strong and steady, she waited, and we were to be saved. A straw hat was offered. It would burn longer. 
that same ship that had come to save us might run us down. But no, she is still. The ship and the dawn came together, a living painting. And the, when you hit the tipping point, you've come to a place where you've gone so far that you can't return. There's another picture of what they think it looked like as it was going down. It split in two as, it, as on the way down. There's another picture. That one's at a pretty steep angle now. It gets worse. There's a really steep angle. And the people in the lifeboats, well, when this was, there, were all, there was over a thousand people standing up on the upper end of this thing as this was going down. The, as, it, as it went down, of course, the people would climb up to the, to the back of the ship. And so there was over, over 1,000 people standing on the back of that ship at that point. And the people in the lifeboats were watching. You can hardly see there. It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's, it's ready to go under. Only the, the very back of the ship is even above the water. There is another one. The tipping point is when you've gone so far that you, you can't reverse course and go back to where you were before. You can't do that anymore. Now, there are many areas in life where, not just in ships or airplanes, where you can reach a tipping point where you can't return to where you were before. Take, for instance, the whole issue of disability. Did you know that between 2009 and 2012, the number of people in the United States with disability rose seven times faster than the number of new jobs? Seven times faster. According to the records, in one county in Alabama, one out of every four working age adults is officially disabled. How far can that go? Could you reach the point? Could, can you go till there's 20% of your population disabled? 40% of your population disabled? Somebody says, well, a lot of those people aren't really disabled. I would agree. But those people aren't doing anything productive. So how long can your country go on as that number keeps going up and up and up? There are many people in this country that are very alarmed about this situation. Closely related to that is health care. The percentage of our gross national product, gross domestic product in the United States, the, gross per, the percentage of that that we spent on health care in 1960 was 5.2%. The total goods and services produced in this country, we, produce, we spent 5.2% of that on health care in 1960. But in 2008, we spent 15.2%. How long can that keep going up? Or is there a point where it can't keep going up anymore without something breaking down? Or let me ask it to you another way. What would happen if there were more sick people to be taken care of than there were well people who could take care of them? You think that could happen? Would you be at a tipping point if something like that happened? Would you be at a point where there, there was no way to return? In that case, the health care system would have reached a tipping point. What if a large number of people decided that the hope of a reward was not worth the economic risk involved? Do you know what would happen? What would be the result of that decision by large numbers of people? The result of that decision would be that the job market would absolutely dry up. There wouldn't be jobs. There simply would not be jobs available. The job market would have reached a tipping point. There are a large number of people in the world that make their living in sales or in selling. Now, I'm sure that you've thought of this at some point. You cannot sell anything unless there's a buyer. Does that make sense? You can't sell anything unless there's a buyer. 
But what would happen if there weren't buyers? That is the exact, precise condition that is described in Revelation 18. Just read it for yourself. It says there's no buyers. If there's no buyers, you collapse. I was uh, reading yesterday about uh, a U.S. senator, actually. This happened in, you know, I don't remember the date. I didn't write it down. It was in, two, it was in the fall of 2008, but I don't remember the exact date. It was at the time when our credit system, monetary system, just about froze up. This senator called his wife, and he said to her, he said, I want you to go to the ATM, and I want you to withdraw as much money from our account as, you, as they will allow you to draw out. However much the master means they'll allow you to draw out, draw it out right now. Interestingly, there was a very high-placed government official in California did the very same thing. Called his wife, very same day. Go to the ATM machine, withdraw as much money as they will allow you to withdraw. What were they afraid of? Our entire monetary system was in danger of freezing up because it had gotten to a point where the banks would not loan each other money. Now, <clears throat> perhaps some of you are unaware of how the monetary system works, but there are trillions of dollar, dollars. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe No, it is trillions of dollars. <laughs> There are trillions of dollars that are constantly exchanging hands between different financial institutions all over the world every day. It's bigger than the stock market, bigger than the bond market. The bond market, of course, is between 10 and 20 times bigger than the stock market, but the currency markers are bigger than either one of those. And, that, and, when the, and that, all of that, by the way, is based on trust. And when people are too scared to do a transaction, it freezes it up. Read Revelation 18. People can't see it coming, but when it comes, all of it, you reach the tipping point and boom, it, you can't return. Often people do not realize that they are reaching a tipping point until it is too late to correct their course. And the tipping point is the point at which it is no longer possible to reverse your course and thereby solve the problem. Let me give you one more example. In the 1970s, we thought that we had a huge national debt in this country because the national debt in this country at that time was over, in the late 70s, it was over $600 billion. And we thought, we thought that was terrible. In fact, when... Paul Volcker became chairman of the Federal Reserve. He decided we were going to solve this problem with inflation. Some of you might remember he jacked the interest rate up to double digits. And the, uh, you, I can remember when you could get 8 or 9% on a savings account at a bank because the interest rate was so high and they were trying to solve that problem. And uh, sure enough, the inflation rate came right back down. The interest rate was jacked up very high in order to curb inflation. By the way, the government does not have the power to do that anymore. Because today, the national debt in our country is not six or seven hundred billion. Today, the gross national debt is over seventeen trillion dollars. Thirty times what it was in the late seventies. Now, if you look at the entitlement problems that we have in place and the escalating unfunded liabilities, it should become clear that we have probably passed the tipping point already. And that these debts will never be paid off in dollars that are worth anything near what the dollars loaned were worth. But the Bible talks in Ezekiel 7 and in Revelation 18 about a time when the tipping point will be passed, and as a result, the whole world economy will shut down. And at the end of the world, the tipping point will be reached in multiple areas of life, not just in economics, 
The tipping point will be reached in multiple areas of life so that return to the former condition is impossible. Just as an example. It's something that's already happened. This happened, I believe, not terribly long before I was born. I still saw it a little bit. Uh, when I was a small child, we did have a neighbor, and his only transportation was his horse. We had one neighbor like that, only one of our many neighbors. But for the most part, we had already passed the tipping point before I was born. The tipping point where automobile transportation had taken the places of transportation by animals, and there was no way to go back to the way it was before. No way. Now, we've already talked about health care and monetary policy. Let me ask you this question. What happens? What happens if a person has refused to surrender to the pleading of the Holy Spirit in the conscience? Until finally, maybe he doesn't even hear the voice anymore. If that happens, that person has reached a tipping point. He's not going to be able to return the way it was before. In Desire of Ages, on page 383, Ella White is describing what happened with Jesus and his disciples the day after the feeding of the 5,000. And this is what she says. When Christ forbade the people to declare him king, he knew that a turning point in his history was reached. What was the turning point? Well, she says, multitudes who desired to exalt him to the throne today would turn from him tomorrow. Now, why would they turn? Why was it that they wanted to crown him king, but in a few days they're going to hate him and want to kill him? Why, what, how, what would do that? She says that their disappointment would turn their love to hatred. Did you know that the human mind works that way? Disappointment can turn love to hatred. When I was, oh, I think I was out of grade school already, probably in early high school, we lived in Longmont, Colorado. There was a young man there, high school age, and in his mind, he, had, he loved his girlfriend so much that he knew that he wanted to marry her. He couldn't stand the thought of not being married to her. They weren't even engaged yet, I don't think. But that was his plans and his intentions. But a time came when she decided that she didn't want to be his girlfriend anymore. What do you do when you have that kind of a disappointment? He was, he was utterly disappointed and he couldn't take it. I suppose he deceived her into doing this. He decided, if I can't marry that girl, there's nobody else going to marry her either. And he got her in his car, and he started down the road, faster and faster and faster. I knew that road real well, until they were going probably... Back in the late 50s, by the way, we had cars that would do over 100 miles an hour. <laughs> a lot of cars won't go that fast today. But we, the cars we drove then, they'd go over 100 miles an hour. My father's Oldsmobile, we tried it out, it went 117. It went faster and faster and faster. I knew that road. I knew that when you came to a place and there was a place that you would come before you, it would take you to Boulder, but before you got there, there was a turn in that road, a sharp turn, and you couldn't go much faster than 45 or 50 and make it around that turn. Well, he was going 100 or more when he got there, and there was no way they would make it. And, that, and she had been screaming for a, a while because she knew that this was, this was a bad situation. But it was too late. They were both killed in the accident. See, disappointment can turn love into hatred.
That's what it did here. She says, disappointment would turn their love to hatred and their praise to curses. Read it for yourself. The Desire of Ages, page 383. That disappointment results in a turning point. It says, from the first he had held out to his followers no hope of earthly rewards. If men could have had the world with Christ, multitudes would have proffered him their allegiance, but such service he could not accept. Of those now connected with him, there were many who had been attracted by the hope of a worldly kingdom. These must be undeceived. The deep spiritual teaching in the miracle of the loaves had not been comprehended. This was to be made plain. And this new revelation would bring with it a closer test. Because they were too vain, this is page 392, Desire of Ages, because they were too vain and self-righteous to receive reproof, too world-loving to accept a life of humility, many turned away from Jesus. Why did they turn away? She mentions two things. They were too vain and too self-righteous to accept reproof. That's one. They would not accept reproof. And the second thing she mentions, that they were too world-loving to accept a life of humility. Two things. That's what caused them to turn away. That's what caused them to reach a tipping point in their life. They had loved Jesus, and they had praised Jesus, and they had come by the thousands to listen to him. And they believed that he was the Messiah. Until they found out that he also reproved their sins. told them that he was meek and lowly and hard and they needed to become like he was. And so they, many people turned away. So many people turned away that Jesus turned to the twelve and he said, are you going to turn away too? Now, when this happened, notice what Ellen White comments on this, that many turned away. Why did he turn away? First reason was they would not accept reproof. I have studied this subject just a little and I came to the conclusion a long time ago already. Are you listening? I'll put it in first person so you won't feel bad. If I cannot accept reproof, I cannot be saved. Is that true? If I cannot accept reproof, I cannot be saved. I'm lost. That's what resulted in them being lost. And then Ellen White comments about that. They were lost because they would not accept reproof and they were not willing to live a life of humility. And then this is what she says. Many are still doing the same thing. <laughs> What's happening? Many people are still doing the same thing. Now, you can tell by looking at me that I'm old. I'm old enough that, you know, I've been around for a while. And I can tell you, friends, I have enough experience to know. And I'm talking about Adventism. I'm not talking about the Catholics or the Methodists or the Buddhists or any of those people. I'm talking about Adventists. Being able to accept the slightest kindest, mildest rebuke or reproof is one of the most rare traits to be found in the Adventist church. And my dear friends, I'm not telling you this to make you feel bad, but I want you to think, are you going to be saved? Let me tell you something. If you are going to be saved, believe me, if you are going to be saved, at some point, the Lord is going to arrange things though that you are going to be rebuked.
Don't think that it doesn't happen to me or doesn't happen to other people. Don't, don't think that. She says, souls are tested today as were those disciples in the synagogue at Capernaum. When truth is brought home to the heart, they see that their lives are not in accordance with the will of God. They see the need of an entire change in themselves. Friend, when you pray, do you ask the Lord the question? Do you say, Lord, is my life in perfect harmony with your will? Do you pray that way? Do you say, Lord, if there's something in my life that's not in perfect harmony with your will, please show me what it is. By the way, the, the way the Lord might show you what it is is by sending somebody to reprove you about something. She says, they see the need of an entire change in themselves, but they are not willing to take up the self-denying work. Therefore, they are angry when their sins are discovered. They're angry when their sins are discovered. Friend, let's think it through. If my sins are discovered... I should say, Lord, thank you for making it possible for me to be saved. If I now know what's wrong, I can go to the Lord and I, that can be taken away from me and I can be changed. But if I get mad when my sins are discovered, when my sins are discovered, if I get mad instead, instead of saying, Lord, I want to be changed. I get mad. How dare you talk to me that way? You ever heard of somebody talk, anybody ever talk that way to you? How dare you? And then she says, praise and flattery would be pleasing to their ears. Now let's think about that for a minute. When I was in I can't remember. I think I was in college. When, but, but I think I, maybe it was in, in high school the first time I read it. I read it more than once. A book by Dale Carnegie called How to Win Friends and Influence People. You ever seen or heard of that book? I read it through, I think, a couple of times. Do you know one of the things he teaches you in that book? Don't ever, what you do, don't ever tell somebody that they're wrong. <laughs> they can't take it. You know that, do, do you know, friends, that that's what Jesus had to do all the time? He had to tell people, you can't go to heaven the way you are. You, you have to be willing to change this and this and this. That's, do, do you understand that that was one of the major reasons that Jesus was crucified? She says, praise and flattery would be pleasing to their ears, but the truth is unwelcome. They cannot hear it. What is the truth that is unwelcome they can't hear? It's the truth about my condition. That's what it is. If you'll make me feel good, then we'll be friends and we'll go to heaven together. But if you tell me all what's wrong with me, then don't treat me that way. The problem is, friends, many people that think they're going to heaven aren't going to heaven. Because they reach a tipping point when their sin is revealed. And instead of saying, Lord, I'll put it in first person. Instead of saying, Lord, I want to be saved so much, I want to be with Jesus so much, that whatever's wrong with me, I want you not only to show me, but I want you to take my sins away and give me the Holy Spirit so that I can change. I want to be born again. 
If you pray like that, a miracle can happen in your life. But if you get angry when something happens that reveals your sin, you're stuck. There's no way for you to be saved. You've reached a tipping point. You are stuck. Those people, by the way, I didn't, I didn't copy the reference now, but Ellen White says concerning those people at the day after the feeding of the 5,000, she says that decision was never reversed. Are you going to meet them in the kingdom of heaven? No. That's about 20,000 people, by the way. 5,000 men beside women and children. But you're not going to meet them in the kingdom of heaven. They ate of the miracle bread and the miracle fish. They, they watched Jesus open the eyes of the blind. They watched him heal those that were deaf. They watched him heal the lepers. Some of them had seen him raise the dead. Some of them had. They knew that he had power to heal all manner of disease. And they, wa they loved him until, until they were reproved, until their sin was pointed out. And then their love turned to hatred. And Ellen White says, that's happening still today. She says, when the crowds follow and the multitudes are fed and the shouts of triumph are heard, their voices are loud in praise, but when the searching of God's Spirit reveals their sin and bids them leave it, they turn their backs upon the truth and walk no more with Jesus. That's Desire of Ages 392. Oh, they're excited. They want to follow the Lord. They want to follow Him right into the kingdom. They want to do His will. But, remember what I mentioned this morning? If the Holy Spirit comes to you, what is the first thing that the Holy Spirit does? The first thing that the Holy Spirit does when it comes to any person is if there is any sin in my life, the Holy Spirit will put His finger right on that. And let me tell you what happens. If you accept that, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of where you're wrong, and it, it is not pleasurable, <laughs> it is not pleasurable to have the Holy Spirit point out what's wrong in your life. That is not pleasurable, it hurts. But if you accept it, and you say, Lord, I yield to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. If this is not pleasing in your sight, I want not only forgiveness, but I want to be changed. Lord, I want you to change the way I think and the way I feel so that that will change the way I talk and the way I act. And if you're willing to yield to that pleading, that convicting of the Holy Spirit, a miracle will take place in your life and you'll start to realize the victory. And when, when you realize the victory, do you know what will happen then? Are you ready for this? When that happens, the Holy Spirit will put his finger on another problem. Say, how about this? You see, the problem is that I have more than one problem in my life that the Lord has to deal with. Do you have more than one problem in your life that the Lord has to deal with? So, the Holy Spirit puts His finger on the problem, the most critical problem. But when you have the victory on that, the Holy Spirit's going to put His finger on another problem. My dear friend, do you really want to receive the Holy Spirit into your life? The Holy Spirit can bring a divine miracle into your life. But one of the things that I've been learning lately, I guess I should have known it a long time ago, 
But one of the things I've been learning lately is that the Holy Spirit will never, ever use any form of coercion or force. Never. And if I turn away, the Holy Spirit will let me turn away. Did Jesus let these people turn away? If I say by my actions, no, Lord, not right now. Do, do Christians ever say that? Yes, they do, friends. If I say, no, Lord, not right now. I can't do it. I can't give that up right now. Holy Spirit will never force you, never coerce you. Holy Spirit will just leave you alone. You'll have a guilty conscience. If you haven't committed the unpardonable sin, you have a guilty conscience. Do you know, friends, that there are Seventh-day Adventist Christians who have had a guilty conscience for many years? And it's dangerous because if you have a guilty conscience and you don't do something about it, after a while, you don't feel as bad as you used to. And if you don't feel as bad about it as you used to, are you ready for this? You are on the way. You haven't done it yet. You haven't tipped yet. You haven't committed the unpardonable sin yet, but you are on the way. Because as you go on and on with that guilty conscience and you don't do anything about it, eventually it doesn't bother you quite as much. And eventually then it doesn't bother you quite as much and bothers you less. When the time comes it doesn't bother you at all, you're lost. Does that make sense? See, the, the unpardonable sin generally is not... The unpardonable sin is not like falling off a cliff. No. I'm not saying that it can never happen that way. But generally, that's not the way the unpardonable sin happens. The unpardonable sin is like walking down 10,000 steps. You just keep the Holy Spirit's pleading with you, not now. Again, not now. Again, not now. Thousands and thousands of times. But eventually, it doesn't bother anymore. She says, as those disaffected disciples turned away from Christ, a different spirit took control of them. They could see nothing attractive in him whom they had once found so interesting. Every time I study this, I say, Lord, did that have to be? Evidently, Jesus didn't make mistakes like I make mistakes. If it was somebody that a fallible human being like me, you could say, well, you, you, didn't, you didn't do it quite right. And that's what we say to each other all the time, unfortunately. Oh, you, you didn't do it quite right. I learned a long time ago. It's always easy for somebody from their armchair to tell you after the fact what could have been done better. Actually, the principal actors could have done it better often if they'd have known ahead of time what was known later. But a different spirit took control of them. That was not the Holy Spirit. Ellen White says that they rejected their Savior because they longed for a conqueror who would give them temporal power. They wanted the meat which perishes and not that which endures to everlasting life. By the way, that very same time, did you know that it was that very same time, that very same day? It was the, at the feeding of the 5,000, and what happened the next day, that was the turning point in the life of Judas. Did you know that? Ellen White says so. I'll read it to you. She says, Christ's discourse in the synagogue concerning the bread of life was the turning point in the history of Judas. He heard the words, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. He saw that Christ was offering spiritual rather than worldly good. He regarded himself as far-sighted and thought that he could see that Jesus would have no honor and that he could bestow no high position upon his followers. He determined not to unite himself so closely to Christ 
but that he could draw away. He would watch, and he did watch. My dear friend, there are many Seventh-day Adventist Christians like that today. They're part of the church. But they're in a position where they can back out if they need to. There are several times when Ellen White talks about these turning points that people reached in the lifetime of Jesus. And one of the major turning points was at the feeding of the 5,000 and what happened the next day that I've just reviewed with you. One other occasion when a group of people reached a turning point, and this is a really, really sad story too. It didn't involve 20,000 or 20 or 30,000 people like the feeding of the 5,000 did, but it, didn't, it involved the home church where Jesus had gone to church in Nazareth, the synagogue, all the time when he had been growing up. So these people, these people had known Jesus since he was a little child, and because they had known him since that time, they, they knew. They knew that he lived a blameless life. But notice what Jesus said about them in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verses 57 and 58. They were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. It's very, that was toward the end of Jesus' ministry. At the beginning, that was the second time they rejected him. The first time they rejected him is recorded in Luke, the fourth chapter. And we won't take time to read the whole account. It's a fairly long account. It starts in verse 16, Luke 4, and it goes clear through from verse 16 through verse 30. And everyone, it says, was astonished and marveled. That's verse 22 at the gracious words which receded out of his mouth. At first, they were convinced, and Ellen White says they had an almost irresistible conviction that this was the Son of God, and he had grown up right among them. They knew that he had a blameless life. They'd, they had seen him for the last 30 years, or 28 years. But then he looked at them. See, Jesus did things over and over again that from a human point of view, people think, well, that's not the way to prosecute the work. And if you go down to verse 23, he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal thyself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he said, Surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And then he said, and this is what made him angry. He said, I'm telling you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah the prophet. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Sidon, to a woman that was a widow. And then he said, And there were many lepers in Israel, in the days of Elisha the prophet, and to none, none of them were healed, except Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard him talk about how the heathen were in a better condition than they were, that was too much. They wouldn't accept that. When I read the story of Jesus, I find that he did this often. He presented, people say, oh, that's not the way, you, don't you know that they'll reject you when you say that? I said, but that's what needs to be said. You need to understand that the, what he told them in effect was, the heathen who are living up to all the light they have are better than God's chosen people 
in his sight who are not living according to what they know. That's not very pleasant, isn't it? Is it? You mean a, a heathen is better in God's sight than me? I'm a Christian. Well, that's what they thought. Ellen White talks about that. She says, here was the turning point with that company. As Christ's divinity flashed through humanity, their spiritual sight was quickened, a new power of discernment and appreciation came upon them, and the conviction was almost irresistible that Jesus was the Son of God. But Satan was at hand to arouse doubts, unbelief, and pride. They steeled their hearts against the Savior's words as they yielded to the control of Satan. They were fired with uncontrollable rage. Here you have the very same thing. They loved him. They had this irresistible almost conviction. This is the Son of God. This is wonderful. But when he told them that even the heathen that lived up to all the light they had were, were better in God's sight than his own professed people, his own chosen people, they said, no way. That is the worst heresy we've ever heard. That is absolutely impossible. We are God's chosen people. And they, they had such uncontrollable rage that they said, we will kill him. We will, we will not allow somebody to teach that around here. They were so angry that they, they became a mob. They got up. They took Jesus and hustled him up to the top of a mountain, and they were going to cast him down headlong, kill him. The angels rescued him, or he would have been killed on that occasion. Let me ask you this question as we're closing. Is human nature still the same today as it was then? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved badly enough so that you say to the Lord, Lord, whatever rebuke I need, I want it. Whatever needs to be changed in the way I think or the way I feel or the way I talk, I want to be changed. I want to endure whatever pain's involved so that I can be what you want me to be. So, Lord, I could, that I could just be what you want me to be and do what you want me to do and say what you want me to say. You want to be saved that badly? I just pray that the Holy Spirit will help you to understand what we're talking about because I've, I've learned long ago that a Seventh-day Adventist Christian can understand what we're talking about intellectually. I can understand it when we're talking about those people. But when all of a sudden it hits home to me, all of a sudden things change. I can't do this for you, friend. You have to do it for yourself. You'll have to pray. You'll have to say, Lord, what do you see in me that needs to be changed? What reproof do I need so that I don't reach a tipping point that will bring me to everlasting destruction? I hope you'll pray about this. Let's pray together before we go. Father in heaven, we thank you that when we were ruined, that you devised a way so that even the weakest and the chief of sinners could be saved if we are willing to submit to your plan for saving us. And Lord, we are so weak, we are so frail, and we have such poor judgment in and of ourselves that unless your Holy Spirit works in our hearts and minds to change us. We know that we are lost. We look to you realizing our helpless condition. We pray not only that we might receive the merits of Jesus Christ, but we pray that your Holy Spirit will work in our heart and our mind and help us to endure the discipline that's involved 
in having the plan of salvation work out in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.